Hey, it is so great being here at Life Community Church, and I'm about ready to go off script, okay? You okay with that? Uh, I think we have teaching notes inside the program. I'm not absolutely positive about that, but um, I just can't help but go off script a little bit. So either the Holy Spirit is leading this right now, or I'm having an absolute wave of nostalgia and joy and other things bubbling up within. So um, <clears throat> while we were singing and watching videos and everything else, I, I couldn't help but uh, think about an event 25 years ago and then an event eight years ago, and I want to quickly tell you about both of those. 25 years ago, I had the privilege, uh, it was kind of insane, it was one of those God things where God did what did not seem reasonable. I don't know if that ever happens in your life, but 25 years ago, I was a 29-year-old, if you do quick math, I'm 54, I was a 29-year-old celebrating the 90th anniversary of a Baptist church that been, had been established on April 8th, 1900, and we were celebrating our 90th birthday. And it's a long set of circumstances that caused me to be the senior pastor. It was mostly the faith of that church to put their trust uh, in me at that juncture. But a friend in the church uh, did a little pen and ink sketching of the first church building that had been from 1902 to 1906, and then it had been moved to another location in that same little community from 1906, I think, to 1950-something. So he did a pen and ink sketch of that building. It was well known in our community. And uh, so he gave that to me, but he also uh, solicited letters from uh, three people in the church, uh, two twins, uh, adult twins, and then their mother. And the two adult twins had, this was in 1990, had been members of the church since 1932. And they described in their brief little letters on a three by five car what that church had meant to their lives from 1932 to 1990. Their mother had a card that she also put on that uh, pen and ink sketch drawing where she had been a member of the church since 1918 for 72 years. Now, when I received that in 1990, that was a powerful gift. I've kept that with me in every office I've ever been in since then because it reminds me of the faithfulness of God and the faithfulness of his people. And Evelyn and I had no coordination whatsoever, but today I'm going to talk to you about faith. And one of the reasons I'm going to talk to you about faith is that you have to make a choice today as we celebrate this amazing moment. We have this little um, bowl. Uh, <laughs> that has 10 uh, stones that you have to decide today whether this establishment of this place of a memorial, this ten, is this a pinnacle or is this a platform? So eight years ago, I was in uh, Carson Valley, Nevada, just south of Carson City, and we were celebrating our church. At that time, it was known as CVC, Carson Valley Christian Center, and uh, now known as LifePoint Church. And so we were celebrating our 10-year anniversary, and a flood of memories was coming over my mind as I watched the video, and I thought about you, and I, I don't know your names for the good majority of you, and I don't know your stories, but there were covenant churches across the country who prayed for you and never knew your names, never saw your faces, and the vast majority of them would never visit you. And some of you have been here for 10 years, and there were moments in the 10 years where you thought, I'm out of here. If it just gets one millimeter more ridiculous here, I'm gone. <laughs> they were family, right? I mean, maybe you got pulled here. And by the way, if you're a first-time guest here and somebody promised to feed you breakfast or lunch afterwards, they will. I promise you. But we're glad you're here. But if, if you're family here, you know that sometimes family is ridiculous. Sometimes families just get intense, and sometimes it gets challenging, and it gets shaky, and but what family really does, good, healthy family, is that when problem happens, we don't run from it, we run to it. We run to each other, and when hard news comes, we decide that we're going to gather together. When I was a pastor, I used to talk about the fact that life is experienced in video, but it's remembered in snapshots. And I hope when you saw some snapshots on the screen that a story flashed through your mind, and you remember when you went through those amazing hours and you went through those awful hours. And I hope there's somebody here who knows you by name. I hope there's somebody here that you could reach out to. And I hope that as you're part of this big, growing, healthy, loving family, that you also are a part of a smaller, connected group of people within the life of the church. John Wesley said this. We're going to go back to script real quick. And by the way, if, if anything ever messes up between the screens and here, it's my fault, okay? So we're going to go to a John Wesley quote. I love this quote from John Wesley. Catch on fire with enthusiasm, and people will come for miles to watch you burn. <laughs> don't you like that? Isn't that good? Now, don't light yourself physically on fire, okay? But catch on fire with enthusiasm, and people will come for miles to 
to watch you burn. Second Corinthians, or First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 says this, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. I know it doesn't seem like it at times, but when we are doing church, when we are living community, we are actually in a race. We're actually in a race, and we have to decide whether or not we're going to win the prize. Many years ago, uh, because God was punishing me, I became a denominational official for five years. <laughs> Sorry, Evelyn. <laughs> but I, <clears throat> you had a lot of punishment uh, for all those years, but, but I was being punished for five years. And I was a denominational official. It was my job to work with lots of churches, and occasionally churches would come to me who needed a pastor. And invariably, I developed a little tactic that I would use in my first meeting. I would meet with the group that had been set aside to find a new pastor for the church, and they would say, well, what do you think? And I would say, I think that you should close the church. And they would look at me, their eyes would get a little bit bigger. I'd say, I would think you should close the church and sell the property because if you sold the property, you could give the money to missions and it would just be a lot easier than finding a new pastor. I've done this before. Why don't we just close the church? At that point, people would look at this denominational official and not be very excited about my presence. And they, somebody who was bold and courageous would say, look, that's ridiculous. What do you mean we should sell the church? And I said, well, you know, it'd just be a lot easier. I said, what difference would it make if we closed the church? And then another brave person would start to begin to tell the story of what God was doing in that place. And that's really what I was after at the very beginning. I really just wanted to know if the church closed its doors, its doors would anybody notice? If all of a sudden we got sucked out of this community and we weren't present here anymore, would it matter? Because tragically, a lot of churches think uh, having 52 bulletins a year is success. And my friends, that's not success. Just meeting and gathering, that's not what God called us to do. So today I want to talk to you in just a few minutes about passion and focus. If you're going to take this amazing, awesome, wonderful moment, and I really am grateful for the fact that you have a heart to celebrate. I'm really grateful for the fact that you've endured, that you've planted seeds, and that the, the tree has grown, and it's 10 years, and that's wonderful, and this is the right day to celebrate. But if you stay here, and if you say, this is our pinnacle, we don't go any further, then people whose names you do not know People whose faces you have never seen, your children and grandchildren will not be able to have the benefit of what God intends for Life Community Church. Because this is not the pinnacle. This is a platform. This is uh, not the end of the book. This is chapter one. And you've all been a part of it, and that's wonderful. But sometimes chapter one is just setting the table for what's to come. It's chapter two that we get to move in, where it's amazing. If you ever read the book of Acts, Acts one is awesome. Acts 2 is out of this world. It's incredible. I want to talk to you about some quick passions. Passion for God, passion for lost people, a passion for wholeness, and a passion for impact. Those are the kind of passions that I think we need to have. As I, as I think about our community, a, a passion for God, I love the way that you worship here in the church. I could tell that when worship occurs, you're ready to enter in, and I love that about you. I love that when you come here, you know that in addition to the necessary coffee and connections and all that, that when we worship, that's not just warm up for the people who are going to talk. That worship is actually entering in and touching the heart of God. I pray that you have a passion for lost people. Do you know that we live in a world with folks whose hearts are far from God, and many of them have determined that the church is the problem. Many of them are actually open and inclined to hear about and meet Jesus and they want to know if he is who he said he was and can he really forgive and give me freedom and hope for a future but sometimes unfortunately the church has a really bad name in our world so I just hope that this church has a passion for people that we don't look at people with condemnation and judgment we look at people with love and care and concern we should have a passion for wholeness I'm convinced that all of us need to be forgiven and free but we also need to get grounded and we also need to be healed I was born and raised in the church. I used to never think that I needed to be healed until years later God revealed to me that in the story of the prodigal son, I didn't really relate to the prodigal. I wanted to relate to the father, but truth be told, I was a lot more like the elder brother. Like I could relate to kind of doing the right things, and some of you in the room can and some of you can't. I can relate to doing the right things, being a fairly straight arrow, not messing up too terribly bad, at least not that was publicly known. That's another story. But I can remember reading that story and thinking, you know, I'm actually most like the elder brother, who's a little bit torqued that the father's so free, 
with giving away all the resources of the family to the kid who messed up. Now maybe you have siblings like that who've gone south, who've taken wrong turns and been on a lot of detours, and you've been on a fairly straight road. It's, it's easy for the church to get mean-spirited and condemning, but I believe God wants us to have a great love and a great passion for people whose hearts are far from God. And he ultimately wants us to impact the world. I wrote out this sentence. I've been living with this for years. I'm more convinced than ever that for God-sized things to happen, we have to ma- remain risk-taking, faith-filled, Jesus-trusting, culture-engaging men and women of God. The church should be a safe place for a dangerous message. This church is all about transformation. It's about the power of God to change a human heart. It's about the power of God to give you freedom from your, your forgiveness for your past and freedom in your present and hope for the future. And I'm convinced for this church to move from this being a pinnacle to it being a platform. In other words, for you to go higher and higher, for you to go further and further, to see more and more people impacted, that you've got to be able to focus on one thing. How many of you remember the movie City Slickers? Remember that years ago? Jack Valance is there and Billy Crystal in that scene and that one scene that a lot of us remember in the movie is that Jack Valance hands up his, puts up his finger and says, one thing. There's just one thing you've got to focus on. And Evelyn, you'll like this. I think the one thing that we have to focus on is faith. If we're going to take this from a pinnacle, and this is a pinnacle, but we're not going to stop there. We're going to make this a platform. We've got to focus on one thing, and that's faith. So let me quickly share a couple things. In Hebrews eleven six, 6, it says, Without faith, it's impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Quick little definition, Hebrews 11, 1. What is faith? Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. In Genesis chapter 11, verse 8, we talk about Abraham. It says this, By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place where he would later receive his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Now, if you're a woman in the audience, you say, what's, what's new about that? All men do that. They take off and go where they do not be going. And, and as a man, I just say, look, if I'm uh, not out of options, I'm not lost. If I've still got options, I'm not lost. It's just a difference in the way genders tend to see these things. But I love the story of Abraham. God tells him to go to a place where he does not know. And when he tells him to go there, and Abraham says, well, how will I know when I get there? God says, I'll tell you. It is taking that first step on the staircase, and the next step, and the next step. Abraham obeyed when he didn't know where God was taking him. And he obeyed when he did not know how God's will would be accomplished. He obeyed when he did not know when God would fulfill his promises. And he obeyed when he did not know why God was doing what he was doing. A lot of times people get to this point in the journey. We're 10 years in, we got a building. A lot of you remember when you were at Silverado Middle School, right? I've heard the stories. I think I got connected to Chuck and to the church about uh, eight or nine years ago. And I remember when you were having your offices in a little industrial building. I remember coming over from Nevada and connecting with the leadership team. And a lot of people get to a place like this and they say, this is the time for us not only to rest and pitch our tents, this is the time for us to stay. In fact, it's not only the time for us to stay, it's the time for us to stop risking. Kind of easy to keep doing what you're doing now, isn't it? I mean, you've got a rhythm to it. Some of you remember when you started to plant a church and you had to actually tear down and set up every week. And when I came in today, people were setting up outside, but setting up outside, even though it's challenging and difficult and requires work, is nothing like having to set this up every week. Isn't it awesome that God's provided a building? That's fantastic. It's great. Let's give him thanks and praise for that. Come on. But some of you have been here long enough to know this. This didn't happen without risk. It didn't happen without trust. It didn't happen without some of you saying, I'm going to give sacrificially. And some of you know the stories. I'm not really good at handyman work. I'm not really good at outside things. But for three years, I mowed my lawn in Nevada so that we could give the money that we would have spent for uh, being able to have the lawn mowed by somebody else who was gifted and called and the hand of God wanted them to mow my lawn. But instead, (laughs) I mowed my lawn for three years so we could take that money and we could give it to our church that was building a building in Nevada. And many of you have made sacrifices like that and greater still. And you know that this wouldn't exist without sacrifice. And some of you are here today going, this is amazing. I'm so glad to be part of this family. It's awesome. We got this house. It's wonderful. And I'm done. Let's just maintain it. But I have to tell you, there's people in our community who haven't been reached. There's families that haven't yet been touched. 
there's men, there's women, there's boys and girls who have yet to know the love of Jesus. In fact, they're a little sketch about the church, to be honest. They hold the church kind of at arm's length, kind of go like this. I'm not sure I want anything to do with the church. Every church I've ever met is mean. People have stories about an usher slapping their hand when they were nine. I'm convinced that in some church somewhere, there was an usher who slapped the hands of people when they were nine. Because people tell me that story. I had a bad experience in church. Or maybe you had a pain of a divorce. And the church treated you badly. And so a lot of people have bad feelings about church. But Life Community Church can either decide that this is a pinnacle or it's a platform. Because there's people out there who haven't yet been reached with the love of Jesus. And I think I know the heart of your pastor, and I think I know the heart of this church. You don't want to stop here. There's people whose names you do not know and faces you've not yet seen who desperately need you to be willing to risk for the next leg of the journey, who desperately need you to move on. I was thinking about some stories in my own life, and in the New Testament, there's 1,050 commands of Jesus, and every single one of those commands involves risk. It's the risk of saying yes to forgiveness and no to bitterness. As I was thinking about my own life, I was thinking about uh, when we had our first child, and just very quick, by the way, Chuck, I would get a red clock back there so I could see the time much more clearly, but I love it that I can't hardly see that back there, so um, I'm just going to go, okay? All right, thanks. He says yes. Michael next to him goes, please don't do that. Please don't do that. So uh, really quickly, uh, uh, I got married. Don't do this at home. I'm a trained professional, but I got married at 18, and so... uh, About four and a half years later, uh, we were going to have our first child. And, uh, you know, if you're a man and you're going to have, your job is this. Your job is to provide the transportation. You know, get get the valuable cargo to the, the, so that's what we did. And we packed the bag and all that. So the the night came and I don't know, I think it was around nine o'clock, 10 o'clock at night. My wife said, hey, we got to go, we got to go, we got to go to the hospital. And are you sure, are you sure? Yes, yes. So I'm freaking out inside, but I know my job, which is to carry the bag put the, the wife in the car, start the car, back out of our apartment, go to... So we get about, and thankfully to Jesus, it was only about a quarter of a mile away from the apartment, and um, we have a flat tire. At that moment in time, I want you to know, I still was positionally a Christian. I still, um, in, in, in truth, was a, was a follower of Jesus. But at that moment of time, I was quite upset with the order of things in the universe, and I remember just crying out to God and saying, are you kidding me? A flat tire? I'm go- My wife's pregnant. This is our first child. So I literally get out of the car. We pull it to the side of the road. I run back to the apartment. I get our other car, which was a worse clunker than our good clunker. So we had the good clunker car and the worst clunker car. I don't know if you've ever been there. So we had the worst clunker car. So I get the worst clunker car, and I get that, and I drive back to the place. We get all the stuff out. We got to the hospital, and you know, first labor takes a while. So we just kept going, and finally, the next afternoon... So all through the night, next afternoon, we had our baby, and the thing about the flat tire was uh, forgotten, but we'll never forget that story. And we'll never forget that story because as we faced the reality of our fears and the struggles of that journey to the hospital, it was all worth it because at the end, we got to hold a precious baby. And that precious baby is uh, 31 years old today, and if I can convince her to sit on my lap, I still do that. And if I can convince her to spend any time with dear old dad, I still do it. Because I remember when she was a little baby and I got to bring her home from the hospital. So I don't know where you are today in the journey at Life Community Church. And I don't know if you're like all in or if you're part in or you're like Mr. Wilson looking over the fence and just kind of checking out what other people are doing. But I want you to know this. God longs for you to be all in. So I want to say a couple things and I'm going to have Michael take the offering. And what they told me is they will never invite me back if this is not a good offering. Okay? So I just want to prepare you in advance. So a lot of times you hear in life the saying, face your fears. And I don't know what's keeping you from being all in at Life Community, but I imagine some of us here would go, 10 years, that's awesome, look where we are, we've got a house, we've got parking spaces, we're next to a McDonald's, I mean, life's good, what else do we need? But I want you to know that God wants this church to risk more than you've ever risked. He wants you to reach more than you've ever reached. He wants you to literally consider what he has. So I want to just say a couple things for you. Don't face your fears. The Bible tells us, or people tell us to face our fears. I'm telling you, don't face your fears. God gave me this a couple years ago, and I think it's powerful. You need to hear this. Don't face your fears. Face your father. Don't face your fears. Face your father. And if you will surrender your fears to your father, 
you can persevere because you'll be looking at the one who formed the universe. There's a little spiritual formula that I have, spiritual equation, you plus Christ equals wholeness and meaning. I really believe that this church can do anything that it's willing to have faith for as long as you're not facing your fears, you're facing your father. Neil Anderson said, being a Christian is not just getting something, it's being someone. So I want to just go on a quick little journey, just two minutes. I want to imagine with you Life Community Church 10 years from now. And I want to imagine a Life Community Church 10 years from now with nothing relative to numbers. But I want to imagine this church on mission. I want to imagine you on mission by faith and empowered by God. I want you to imagine 10 years from now the legacy that you'll leave to the generation that will come. See, because if Jesus doesn't come back to the earth, 10 years from now, there will be a group of people, and some of you will still be here, but others of us will not. The Lord will take us in different directions. The Lord will take us on different journeys. But I'm, my question for you is, what are you willing to do the next 10 years to make sure that Life Community Church is not experiencing a pinnacle, but this is merely a platform where we stop, we celebrate, we honor God, we give thanks, but then we get on with the next leg of the journey. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7 says, Just as you've received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. I want to ask you to step into chapter 2. If we read chapter 1 of the book and we close the chapter and then we close the book and say that's the end, that'd be a pretty terrible reading experience. Chapter 1 is the setup for chapter 2 and the chapters that follow. I want to exhort you to step into chapter 2. God has a dream for you. He has a hope for you. He has a vision for you. And I really believe this. The best is yet to be. It's been an amazing chapter one. It's been an amazing 10 years. But I can imagine, I can imagine at year 20 that Life Community Church is prevailing and that the community knows about a group of people who love Jesus, who love his word, who love each other, and who love the world around them. And that this church is known for life, for Jesus, for forgiveness, for freedom, and for hope. And he's calling each one of us to be part of that chapter. Would you pray with me? Jesus, I thank you for my friends here at Life Community Church. Thank you for the, the hope that is resident here, for the joy. I thank you for the amazing stories over 10 years for the pictures and the video and the sound and just the life that is present here. And now, Jesus, as we celebrate these 10 years and we just in awe give thanks to you for the gifts that you've given to us, as we have thanks to you for your faithfulness, we pledge our sacred trust that we will not be a people who shrink back. We will be a people who press in and while we celebrate this moment, we declare that this moment is not the end of the journey. It's not the pinnacle that we reach and then we stop. It is a platform that we build on. We declare that we will press in and we will step into chapter two. And we will be people of faith who boldly go where you've asked us to go. And we will take all our fears and we will not face our fears. We will face you and we'll surrender those fears to you so that we can receive the future that you have for us. Jesus, I thank you for my friends. I give thanks and with great gratitude, blessing to you for all the changed lives that have happened here. But Jesus, the best is yet to be. We have just begun the journey that you have us on. So God, it's gonna rock. It's gonna be amazing. And we're gonna lean in and enjoy the experience day by day, hand in hand with you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.